There are four sets of three dragon tiles and four sets of four wind tiles for a total of 28 arm tiles. Step four, understand the bonus tiles. There are two sets of bonus tiles depicting four flowers and four seasons. Each set is numbered one through four for a total of eight bonus tiles. Each tile has significance in Chinese. For non-Chinese speakers, being able to differentiate between tiles is enough to play the game. Step five, to determine who goes first, players roll a die. The person with the highest roll deals, and the person with the dealer's right goes first. The dealer places the tiles face down in the middle of the table and shuffles them around, dealing 13, leaving the rest in the middle. Just like in most card games, players hide their hand. Step six, understand the three types of melts or sets you can create. A palm is a set of three identical tiles, a kong is a set of four identical tiles, and a chow is three suited tiles in sequence. Step seven, the starting player draws a single tile from the draw pile and discards a tile face up from their hand into the draw pile to maintain a constant 13 tiles. Step eight, when a player discards a tile, any other player can announce that they are picking it up to form a palm, kong, or to win the game with a mahjong, with mahjong trumping palm and kong. Players can only pick up a tile for the chow mill if the person sitting to their left was the one who discarded it. If a player creates a meld by drawing a discard, the meld must be shown to the group, but not if it's created by drawing from the draw pile. Step nine. After the player that picked up the tile discards another tile, the player to their right goes next. Step 10. A player wins when they make a mahjong hand, three melds plus a pair. A tile is never discarded on a winning hand. Step 11. There are many varying scoring systems. One simple method is to only score the winning hand. A chow equals one point, a pair of suits two points, a pair of honors three points, a pong of suits four points, a kong of suits five points, a pong of honors six points, and a kong of honors equals ten points. Step 12. After a hand is won, if the dealer has won, they deal again. Otherwise, the deal rotates to the right. The game continues until everyone has had a chance to deal, or until a predetermined number of points has been reached. Did you know, Mahjong originated in 19th century China, and before World War I, each Chinese province had its own rule variations and name for the game. <laughs> okay. I didn't know much, I was so sorry to Jen. That's apparently the case. Um, so, Charles, if you wouldn't mind, pick up the first paragraph here. We're going to read a little more about Mahjong and its connection, or Jewish connection. Mahjong is a game that originated in China, commonly played for, by four players, with some three-player variations, some three and ten. The four-player table version should not be confused with the proper Western single-player, tile matching, computer game, Mahjong Solitaire, which is a recent invention and Completely different from the table game. Similar to the Western card game Rummy, Mahjong is a game of skill, strategy, and calculation and involves in a certain degree of chance. In Asia, Mahjong is also popularly played as a gambling game, though it may just as easily be played recreationally. Uh, uh, the game is played with a set of 136 tiles, different Chinese characters and symbols, also some regional variations with a given number of tiles in most three regions. Each player begins by receiving three tiles. The joint player will discard tiles until they come free. The original hand receiving the 14 14 draw tiles to form the four groups melt in a clear head. They are fairly straightforward about how to strong stone from another player melted to use or create a number of tiles and honor wins and dragons. The king kind no the right. kind of melt and the order of dealing in play. However, there are many regional situations in the rules. In addition, the scoring system, the minimum hand necessary to win varies slightly based on the local level of trading used. Alan, couple. From the tenements of New York City <coughs> to the bungalows of the Catskills and the vast American suburbs, Jewish women have kept alive a game that otherwise fell out of fashion in the 1920s. And yet the Jewish Mahjong, Mahjong connection is hard to explain. As one internet writer asks, how on earth did a 19th century Chinese parlor game 
come to be a favorite pastime for middle-aged Jewish women. The rise and fall of Mahjong. Mahjong's precursors may be several centuries old, but the game most Americans know dates back only about 150 years. Around 1846, a servant of the Chinese emperor combined the rules of popular card games of the time and replaced cards with tiles to create Mahjong. The name itself means sparrows, an allusion to the pictures of birds often engraved on tiles. The advent of Mahjong coincided with China's opening to foreign traders after the First Opium War, 1837 to 1842. One American businessman, Joseph Babcock, traveled to China on behalf of Standard Oil Company in 1912 and brought the game back to America. He changed the number on the tiles to numerals with which Americans are familiar with. And by 1920, Abercrombie and Fitch, then a sporting and excursion goods store, was the first place to sell mahjong in America. And I've read somewhere that they sold like, you know, the first year 12,000 games, so lots. So you would pick up there? Throughout the 1920s, the game was a popular craze. Over time, to make the game more difficult and exciting, playing groups made up their own table rules. As these homemade regulations became more complex and convoluted, players eventually became turned off by the game and the challenge of ever-changing rules. By the end of the decade, the Ma Young fade had died. A Jewish trend, but Jews, particularly Jewish women, did not let the game go. In 1937, a group of Jewish women formed the National Ma Young League, Ma Zhang League, which to this day strives to maintain consistency in the game. Each year, the league issues a card listing winning combinations of tiles, which change every year in standard regulations. This stability helped the game to survive, but Jewish involvement in the league doesn't fully explain the Jewish Ma Young phenomenon. Yeah, Ma Young phenomenon. Right? According to Anita Liu in Christy Olivero's book, Ma Young from Shanghai to Miami Beach, throughout World War II, the game continued to be played among Jewish women's circles as increasing popularity became more prevalent in their lives. While the men were off the war, Lou and Calgaro explained that women found Mahjong to be an inexpensive form of communal entertainment in an urban setting of New York. The game spread from friend to friend, mother to daughter. Another group of historians suggests that Jews fled Nazi Europe to make to Shanghai and got involved in the local culture, adopted the game. Once these refugees immigrated to America in the mid 20th century, they helped keep Mahjong alive. A completely different theory comes from Ruth Unger, current president of the National Mahjong League. She believes that the game was perpetuated in part because of a philanthropic money making endeavors for Jewish organizations, number of sisterhoods, synagogues, the gossip chapters. These groups sell Mahjong cards and wool cards, and receive donations from the league. In order to sell enough cards, they must keep the people interested in playing the game so they continue to teach Mahjong to their members. Your turn. Okay, Buffalo memories. Perhaps the most important factor in Mahjong's survival is the role it played in Buffalo colonies, mm -hmm. popular vacation sites for Jews in the mid 20th century, just above New York City. In Borschfeld Bungalows, Memories of Catskill Summers, Erwin Richmond describes the Jewish vacation culture there. By the middle of the century, Mahjong had spread from the city to the suburbs and the vacation resorts. It went along with the Jews. The click-click of tiles and phrases like five fam and two craft filled the air many an afternoon at the large colonies. New York City, New York resident Joan Cooper finally recalls spending childhood summers at these colonies, where her mother and friends would play Mahjong every afternoon until Friday afternoon when the husbands and fathers drove up from New York City. The women would sit with big hats covering their face and straps on tied on their bathing suits so they didn't get any tangled, says Cooper. The best way to ask something from Mom was during her games. She'd always give me a little money just to make me go away. In the documentary Mahjong, The Tiles That Bind, seasoned players say that Mahjong is their life, as women play for years and decades with the same people. It's kind of like quilting bees. 
They share life events, marriage and divorce, the birth of children and then grandchildren, work and retirement. It is even said when, when the last woman of a Mahjong group dies, it is her job to bring the Mahjong set with her to Allah Haba, the world to come. So in uh, honor of uh, Chinese New Year, we're uh, reading a little bit about uh, the Chinese-Jewish uh, connection. No, as long as you're honoring something. I'm honoring the fact today that I'm proud that I don't give money to public radio. And why is that important today? Well, because I just heard and kind of that if we use the Canadian car sand, so there'll be no stopping global warming. Ah. Okay. And so public radio is getting the message out. That, that's right. And it makes my heart feel so good. So that is a great That thing. I don't contribute to public radio. <laughs> All right. So where are we in our book? We should be oh, on page 134. 134 at the yeah, top? Yes, yeah, Gemara, chapter okay. uh, 5. So, Rabbi Joshua Ben Hanania. Rabbi Joshua Ben Hanania said the only people who ever outweighed me were a woman, a boy, and a girl. What happened with the woman? Once I stayed in him, and the innkeeper made me a dish of beans. On the first day, I ate them and left nothing. And again on the second day, I ate them and left nothing. On the third day, she put too much salt in them, and to taste them, I abstained. She said, Sir, why don't you eat? I replied, I ate earlier in the day, so that you should have not broken bread. Perhaps you have set aside these beans for the, for the servant as payah for those previous ones. For don't the sages say payah is set aside for the from the dish, not from the cooking pot. Okay, so peya has a new and different <coughs> meaning here. It's kind of like uh, the uh, leftovers from the Rebbe's dish, right? Uh, but in this case, the leftovers from this uh, tabu chokom's dish should have been, in this woman's mind, left over for the servants. So she apparently on purpose salted his uh, beans too much on the third day because perhaps on day one and day two, he had not set aside. Peah, what do we normally think of as peah? Peyot, yeah, so that's corners of the, the side curls. Peah is typically set aside from the edges of our fields. So that was one method of making sure that the poor had enough food. In this case, they're talking about peah as leftover for servants. Um, could you pick up 14 so the footnote? The these are payouts, yes, yes, but yes. Similar. Yeah. So they're, the Similar root, kind of. the word has the same root? I don't know, but it may be. The same root. I would say that that's likely, although honestly, I, I'd have to like really look yeah. to make sure. Well, since you brought it up, it would it would seem there's a... I think you could see brought it up. But yeah, I think that that's likely the case. You know, the whole, the whole wonder has nothing to do with the corners. The whole what? The whole thing of leaving the corners. The reason for it, you know, there's, sometimes there's other reasons for things. You know, one of the reasons is when they harvested their field and any machinery they had was not articulated, so it could only go curves. It couldn't go. Well, considering they didn't have machinery degrees. about 17, 2,000 years ago, they were probably doing it by hand, well, would be my guess. You had a lot more machinery than Okay, so they're, okay. All right. Fire alarm. Fire alarm. That, that was exactly why they did it. They, they left the, the no other wires. The field was we one wireless. method of making sure that the poor, other than in this. addition to there's, there's rules like so that. Then when people try so if you leave like a, a corn stalk or something, it wasn't corn, but a stalk of something, a wheat stalk in the middle of the field, you're, you didn't pick it up. That was left for the people who came behind the gleaners. It's actually an Like Naomi and Ruth, you know, we, we think about their stories in the book of Ruth, that they were gleaning the field. So they were going behind the workers, and if the workers maybe left a few extras, and they didn't do the, the, the edges, it was for the people who were very poor. Well, and if you think of the curls on the side, that's, on, that's like on the edges of the face, if we want to stretch it. Okay. So um, could you read the 14th footnote? Um, have set aside, follow the reading of the Vilna Gaon. The standard text read, you have not set aside. 
This is the only place in the Talmud where the notion of Be'a is extended to leading food for servants. It was confided, codified, codified in the Shulhan Aruch. Right, so our, our big like codification, Shulchan Aruch, did codify it. However, it was but ignored by Maimonides. Main right. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that we still think about in terms of leaving leftovers from our plates. Um, but in, at least when the Gemara was written, that was important to them. So go ahead and expand that there. What happened to the girl? I was walking along, and my route passed through a field. A girl said to me, Sir, isn't this a private field? I said to her, It is a well-trodden path and therefore a public right of way. She replied, robbers like you have tried it. Okay, so Rabbi Joshua ben Hanania says he's outwitted by the first one, a woman who salted his beans too much to remind him that he should have left Pe'ah, the second by a girl who's reminding him of what? The corners of the field. Not the girl isn't reminding him of that. Private field. A private field. So she's reminding him of the, the privateness of the field and... He's trying to say, but it's a well-trodden path. And she's saying, no, <laughs> it's only well-trodden by people who are trespassing. So, mm -hmm. all right, number three, uh, the next one. And what happened with the boy? I was on my way when I saw a boy sitting at the crossroads. I asked, which is the way in town? He said, this way is short but long. This, this way is short and but long. And the one, that one, and that one is long but short. Okay, so... First he says short but long, and then he says that other path is long but short. So Rabbi Hanania did. I followed the short but long route, but when I arrived in town, I found that I was surrounded by gardens and orchards. I had to retrace my steps, and I said, "And I said, my son, didn't you tell me that there were, that that was the short route?" He said to me, "But didn't I tell you it was long?" I kissed his head and said to him, "Happy you are." Israel, for you are astute, from the greatest to the smallest. Okay, so basically the, the boy had provided him information, but apparently he hadn't listened carefully to the information. So those are the three people that outwitted Rabbi Joshua ben Hanan. So now we have the little story about Beruria, which is interesting. Let's, um, how many people remember the story of Beruria? We, she was the wife of Rabbi Meir, and anything else? Because we read this when we did uh, As a Driven Leaf, right? Mm -hmm. She was extremely attracted to, who was it? No, she was, she was very pleased to write, but, yes. she, but she learned too much and always seemed to get around and that kind of jealous of her power and her knowledge and set her up to... Have problems. Uh, the problems. What I remember from childhood is that she was uh, very learned. She was very learned. learned recently too. Every last year is that the it, it didn't go well with the rabbi. Yes, and there was some of that. Yes. But let let's read about her from this. This comes from Who's Who in the Talmud, and uh, Shulamit Friedman does a great job of of pulling different sections and and we'll learn more about Maria's life. So. She lived during the fourth generation of Kanaib. There was a mention of her in oh, Pesachim, okay. page 62. Okay. Yeah. She is the only woman in the town who participated in halakhic debates with the Satan and his views were seriously regular. In the debate with Rabbi Tarkun and the other debates on the, on the issue of ritual purity and purity, Rabbi Yehuda, Rumi and Rumi is famous and Rumi is Support. On another occasion, she had a halakhic debate with her brother or father, and Rabbi Meir ben Barak decided the halakha, decided the halakha in her favor. In previous Rabbi Yosef and Sari, the Galilean, once met her Lord and asked her, by which word did you travel and Lord? Okay, so this is the one that actually we're going to read in our, our text, but go ahead, we can read it right now. Okay, so she asked her about which word. Did we travel to Lima? She replied, the Lemurian quote, in the sages say, in Amor 25, the notebook accepted it with women, you should have asked how to work. 
Uh, okay, so her comment, and I, I think we did talk a little bit about this last week, did. right, was don't talk excessively with women. You should have just said how to plot, what, you know, point the direction, right? Instead of what did he say, by which road should we travel? So perhaps the issue was maybe there was some implication that he was inviting her. How that would not be you know, it's like to be right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> right. It was said that she studied 300 reports of 300 pages daily during a period of three years. Okay, smart, pretty smart person. However, yeah. they were a little bit of her life. She watched her father was burnt alive when she was in public. Her mother was pregnant to death because she was taking her house to see Putin. I didn't say you. Um, uh, Zaga, uh, so it's a trap tape. Her brother was killed by a band. Uh, on Shabbat, uh, on one Shabbat afternoon, Rabbi Miller was watching the sky for all and two of the sun. Okay, so now this is like her pain. This is this is her piece of how her life was exceptionally difficult. So not only did she have difficult with her father, her mother, her sister, and her brother, but now this deals with her, the, the most famous or one of the many famous stories about Rabbi Meir and how she was such an incredible sage. So, One Shabbat afternoon, Rabbi Meir was watching a study hall when two of his sons died suddenly. The Rabbi Meir made them on the bed and covered them in a sheet without informing her husband about their death. And why did she do that? Because Shabbat. Because it was Shabbat. No, no negative news, right, if you could possibly avoid it. So, After Shabbat, the Rabbi Meir returned home to ask her, where are my two sons? They went to the study hall, she replied to the son. I looked in the study hall and I didn't see them. She gave him a cup of Kohabdala at the end of Shabbat. Rabbi Meir persisted. Where are my two sons? His wife answered, they were going to a certain place and they are, not, they are coming back now. She gave him something to eat after she said the grace after the meal. She said to him, Rabbi, I have a question. A while ago, a person gave me a pitadon, something to wash for his sins. Now he came forward. Should I return it to him or not? Okay, so now this is the setup, right? This is this entire question has to do with Rabbi Meir, how he's going to respond to this news, right? Rabbi Meir answered, Who that has a pitadon by him, who that has a by him does not need to. So in other words, Rabbi Meir is saying, of course you must return it, right? The Ruria said, if not from your view on it, I would not have returned it. She led him to the room where their sons were lying, and she removed the sheets and looked at him to see that he had sons lying on the bed. He began crying, my son, my son. She said to him, Rabbi, you didn't tell, uh, didn't you tell it to me. If you need to return the Pitadon, you stole it. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. With these words, Rabbi Meir was transported to the last This is for this it says, a woman walked to cook her son. So Asha Chaya. So the Midrash uses this piece uh, to basically extol the way that she broke the news to him. What's that? When people are covering her husband, he prayed that they should be punished. Barrier, uh, the glory resists him, saying that it takes a sinner to be destroyed. Behold, it says. In okay. The okay, so this is another piece where, you know, Baruri comes to sort of like tell the ear, you know, wait a second, should you be punishing the sinners or their sin? So that's the question. And uh, in a and it sounds behind it for the sin should be destroyed. So you know the sin. So the not sin. the sinner, just the sins. Right. You need to pray for mercy on, the, on their behalf that they should repent. Rather than their business is right. I pray for them and they repent. Okay, so this comes from Brachot. So this piece is about, you know, Bururi saying don't pray for those who are antagonizing to be destroyed. Only pray for their 
since that they should do realignment, chuba, something. So don't pray for their death. Just pray that their sins are, are that they turn from their evil ways. Exactly this, right? And, and, and that's exactly why I don't give public radio any money. Okay. Uh, it fits right into time. Okay. <laughs> when we look at Moses' statement of the Savior, that most women are light-headed, Rabbi Neil told her when she was taken, taken for the word, he told one of his students to seduce her after many attempts, when he was overcome, when she heard that Rabbi Neil had sent the men to seduce her, she strangled herself. Okay, so that uh, comes from commentary of Rashi as well as some piece from Talmud in Abu Zara on ETP. Okay, so that's uh, the story of Maria. I wish to write about this particular episode in the book of the Empire of the Roots. And he said that some young girl uh, from the Orthodox background in New York came to him to talk with a question why why would be such a nasty and such a wonderful woman? And he said something, uh, and how will a couple is supposed to be so close to each other, like Gabriel and Gloria? Uh, and end up in this and way. He, uh, yes, and he said something uh, I, uh, God makes a couple of people that kind of match each other and kind of deserve each other, right? So she was just as strong as he was, and it was a fight of equal. It wasn't like it wasn't uh, him using understanding if, he, if she would have done the same thing to his son, for example, to him. She was. I, I've argued that she was forced because that's what apparently should be made up of two equals. I think they were right. But that's what she said. He, 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 I, I, I well, think he said it's an argument of equals, yes. But, you know, in, 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 in a negative form, that right. could be positive. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, with regard to Boria, we, we know a little bit more about her story. And with regard to the situation, what happened, Beria uh, succumbed, but Meir was behind it. And unfortunately, it was just too much, you know, that, that he had set it up from the beginning. Yet, we learned that, you know, not to take perhaps the words of the sages lightly, at least in that instance. Okay, so, um, Alan, you want to pick up there? Where? Uh, we're at the top of, we're actually, back in, back in Rabbi the Yossi. Rabbi Yossi the Galilean was on his way when he met Beruria. He said to her, which way to go to Lida? She said, stupid um, Galilean, don't, don't say you say, oh, we already did, we did this last week for sure. We, what we did, yeah. but that's fine. We're don't just going to read it quickly. It's don't talk too much to women. You should have said, which way to, to um, Lydia. Okay, uh, and then on next. Medication, Beria with chance. On a student who was reviewing his lesson silently, he, he, she rebuked him sharply and said, isn't it written, for he has granted me an eternal pact, draw up in full and secured. If your learning is drawn up in full on the 248 parts of your body, that is, and the footnote says, that is, if you use your voice and limbs as well as your mind, mm -hmm. 248 body parts are listed. Right, so it, it, it's not something that you just think about in your head, but you actually have to sort of like embody that. It will be secure, and if not, it, it, it will not be secure. And indeed, they taught. Rabbi Eliezer had a, had a disciple who used to review his lesson silently, and after three years, he forgot what, what he had done. Okay, so part of that comes to teach us why we have such loud Beit Midrashim, <laughs> that people are like, you know, talking to each other and, and really digging further and deeper into the text to learn and understand what the sages meant. What were they talking about? Why is that the case? What about this other uh, piece of Talmud? How do these two pieces dovetail together? All of those things uh, are, are done kind of in a loud matter, in loud form in uh, many big midrashim. So it's not like people silently sit and study. More anecdotes on the virtue of learning aloud lead to saying on the benefits and joys of Torah study. Here's a selection. Rabbi Joshua ben Levi said, if, you're, if you are on a journey and have no companion, study Torah, for it is said, for they are a grace, graceful accompaniment. 
Um, it, if you like, you go ahead. I was yeah. going to read the footnote, but yeah, that's fine. JPS translates a, a graceful um, wreath, wreath yeah. upon your head. The Hebrew term uh, levia translates wreath as literally a, a company. Okay, so either they're a graceful wreath or they're a graceful accompaniment. Either way, it kind of works. But if one's on a journey, study Torah. That's kind of the, the bottom line, which we're going to hear a lot about that. If your throat is sore, study Torah, as it is said, and a necklace about your throat. If you feel unwell internally, study Torah, as it is said, it will be a cure for your, for your body. If your bones <coughs> ache, study Torah, as it is said, a tonic for your bones. If your whole body feels unwell, study Torah, as it is said, healing for the whole body. So, and literally, this is taken literally from an orthodox standpoint. People actually truly believe that Torah study is a remedy. I mean, certainly people use, in addition to that, you know, doctors and that sort of thing, but literally believe that this is, is in fact correct. Uh, Rav Yehuda, the son of Rabbi Rafia, said, See, the ways of the Holy One, blessed be he, are not like the ways of flesh and blood. It is the way of flesh and blood that if someone gives a friend a drug, it is good for this, but bad for that. But when the Holy One, blessed be he, gave Torah to Israel, it was a cure for all his body. As he said, healing for his whole body. Rava, the son of Rav Yosef, Yosef ben Kama, had upset Rav Yosef. Um, on the eve of the Day of Atonement drew near, Rava said, I will go and make it up with him. He went and found Rav Yosef's servant pouring wine for his master. He said, let me pour. The servant handed over his bottle of fluid. When Rav Yosef tasted it, he said, this tastes as if it was poured by Yosef Bar Hama. He said, um, it is I. Rav Yosef said, don't sit down until you tell me the meaning of these verses. Okay, so what happens is, is apparently there was some argument. They were having some issue. And he goes to be a servant to this guy. This is the way that he's kind of like making up. And Rob has, has such an ability, he could tell that who it was actually poured by. Right? There's actually, you know, in, in terms of Zohar, you'll hear comments about how there's a smell that's imparted by people who pray and those who don't. And that, you know, some people who are very gifted can know by smell, literally, if some people have prayed that day or if they haven't. So, anyway, so he's engaging him now. He's saying, okay, so tell me about uh, this piece of Torah. Learn, teach me a little bit about Torah. You're, you're, you, you've come to be the servant here, but now teach me this little piece of Torah. Let's talk about it. Let me learn something. You know, I can understand that smell for the Jews. Okay. Because if you ever, say, if you have sat in Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, so especially Yom Kippur, and you, you watch people, and some of them get really nervous, and it does make you spiral. Maybe they haven't drank 100% in all year. And they're really worried about how God is looking at them. Okay. So, in particular, you say you, you would notice maybe when people were sweating a bit. And maybe that, that's true. So, at any rate, we, we have now, these are uh, the encampments of Israel. But they come in a particular order. So, what does that mean, you know? As you know, nothing in Torah is just done by chance. There must be some specific meaning as to why they have these encampments in this order. So, okay. Alan, what is that? Thank and you. from Midbar to um, Matanah, and from Matanah to Nachaliel, and from Nachaliel to Bamath, and from Bamath to the valley. He replied, when someone makes himself like the desert Midbar, on, on which everyone tramples. The, the Torah will be handed, handed to him as a gift, matana, when he accepts it as a gift. God will take him as a possession, mahaliyah, as God takes possession of him and ascends to greatness. 
Or it says, wait, what is what is um, Hebrew for gift? Matana. That is matana. Mata. So they name they name the encampment that. Mm -hmm. Right, matan Torah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. So he's he's taking the roots of these and developing the story as to why this is the case, right? Mm -hmm. So we start with Midbar, and the footnote says, if one is humble, does not respond to insults. Basically, that, that whole same thing of, of getting rid of the ego, of you know clearing out the comments within an individual. One then has a matan, or matana, given to them, which is Torah. And then God takes possession of him, nachaliel, so a... a literally possession, and then he becomes bubble, so rises to greatness, or sense. Like, yeah. Oh. Uh, right, right. Uh -huh. Okay, so now how we out to Bamot, um, high, high places, but if he becomes proud, the Holy One, blessed be he, Cast it down, as they said, from Bamoth to the valley. Okay, so there's the warning. So one has to always, 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 just like the Baal Shem Tov argues, always work on the issue of pride. Mm -hmm. This is interesting because uh, in, in the Bible, the, there is a, a kind of a geography of uh, holiness. Like uh, Abraham's child stays on the path, but the Lord chooses to go to the valley. Right. And it keeps repeating this topic, that, uh, this theme, and they repeat it in many instances. And going but down to Egypt, know, coming back yeah. up, making Aliyah, and back up to... Up, um, and, yeah. So from a, from a metaphoric standpoint, a spiritual standpoint, good literary technique standpoint. That's why you're called to the Torah. Called up, called up, called up to the Torah. Torah. <laughs> and not called to the Torah. You're always called up to the And uh, let's see, if he repents, the Holy One, blessed be he, will, will raise him again. As he said, every valley shall be raised. Rabbi Chia Bar Abba said, what is the meaning of he who tends a fig tree will enjoy its fruit? Uh, why are the words of Torah compared to a fig tree? Just as whenever you search a fig tree, you find figs. So whenever you mull over Torah, you discover meaning. Okay, so one, one enjoys digging in, learning more, like uncovering layers. Um, if we back up to the previous story and we look at, okay, so he came to pour wine for him, and then he came to teach him a little bit of Torah, and then he also, it, at some level, is speaking about the situation between him and Rabba, right? Because he's saying, okay, so... Essentially, in, in this story, he's uh, basically asking forgiveness. I mean, essentially, of this, this is kind of the, the under, underlying tone. It's kind of like the ego that I said. Are you asking are you, for forgiveness? Is, is no, 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 no. <laughs> and you'll you probably, you probably get a copy of it from Don. So. Uh, okay, I'll, and, I'll be looking for it then. The tie-in is the presentation. Okay, all right. You have to look that up. Rabbi Shmuel Ben... Naham Hamani said, what is the meaning of a loving doe, a gracious mountain goat, let her, her breast satisfy you at all times, be infatuated with, with love of her always. What are the words, why? why are the words of Torah compared to a doe? This tells you that a doe's womb is narrow, and she satisfies her lover every time as she did the first time. So too the words of Torah constantly satisfy those who learn them as they did the first time. Uh, the, the, you know, underlying theme of sex in the topic. There it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of sex in the topic? Um, actually, there is. If you look for it, it's not too hard to find. There's the, and there's certainly direct um, discussion of it as mm -hmm. well. That's close to being pretty direct. Yeah, that's, I'd say that's 
Uh, I wonder the Yeah, that one actually I can um, we can talk about okay. <laughs> I have my guess about that one. <laughs> I mean, candidly, I, you know, there there is discussion within Talmud about what is appropriate sex, essentially, you know, for a man and a woman. What what is okay, what is not permissible. And my my assumption is is that's probably the section that, that he used. With regard to uh, the Sidur that we've had on our Facebook, um, actually a, a bit ago, in, I think it's 1471, JTS has a copy of the Sidur that a chatan gave to a kala, a, a groom gave to a bride, about um, how the specific, and he wrote it for her, because in that time Sidurim weren't available, like on WordPress, but the specific page where it says, you know, thank God for making me a woman instead of a man. So this is what he wrote specifically for her back in the 1500s, and there's a copy of it online available for us to read, and you can read the Hebrew, um, very nicely done. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually on Temple Beth Or, and we, we probably uh -oh. posted it maybe two, three weeks ago. If you, you can go in and find it, or I'll, I'll find the link and send yeah. it to you. Yeah, it's, it's, on, um, it's on our uh, Facebook page for Temple Beth Or. What's that? Thank God. Well, yes, because the prayer is often says, you know, thank God for making me a man, not a woman. That's the traditional prayer. That's mm -hmm. the one that's often in like Orthodox prayer books. Now, Reform and Conservative prayer books have amended that, um, as well as as Reconstructionist. You know, any of the liberal groups have have amended that, changed it. But they have changed the, in Orthodox for women to say, thank you for making me basically as I am, instead of you know. Thank God for making me a woman, which would be the the like the exact corollary, right? So, thank God for making me kind of a woman is a more powerful statement that was written at least in one prayer book that we know that we still have a copy of from the 1400s. Yeah. 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 It's a very difficult subject for some people, especially for uh, it's a very very orthodox. Well, women are certainly required to pray, but not jointly with men at the same time in the same room. Not, is kind I'm of the not, issue. Uh, that uh, considered an erva or yeah. quote a nakedness, hey, right? Hey, all hey, of those things. Hey, you know, the service, I get up and walk down and tell you say. I know you're joking, but <laughs> <laughs> so back to the uh, uh, where are we at back there. To the text. Yeah, Let me continue. A graceful mountain goat. Torah brings grace to all who learn her. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Why are the words of Torah compared to the breasts? This tells you that just as when a baby sucks, he finds milk, so, so too, whenever you mull over words of Torah, you discover meaning. And, and often there's a, a metaphor of uh, used in this, this fashion of as the cow wants to give the milk, you know, the, the calf wants to suck the milk, and that's our metaphor for wanting Torah. It's one of the, the graphic images that, that is often and traditionally used. Okay. Be infatuated with love of her always. Like Rabbi um, Eliezer ben Hadad, of whom they said, Eliezer sat engrossed in Torah in the lower market of, of, of Sephoris, while his, I was in the while his, wow. while his goods were on display in the upper market of Sephoris. I was on that street. So tell, tell us about Sephoris. Oh, it's, 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 it's an old town in, in the Galilee. Um, it's where the sages of, of, the, of the Talmud lived. And it um, has some beautiful uh, mosaics in the, in, the, in the synagogue that was uncovered. And beautiful mosaics in, the, in, the cent in some central buildings. I, I get some like image that it had to do with there was um, a perfumery or something like that. Is that correct? Oh, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't recall. 
a guy talking about the, about the funeral. Right, but it's, it's, to me, it was an interesting example of sort of Hellenistic influence on, you know, buildings and, and art in, you know, in, in our past in, in, in Israel. Yeah. So. And you, you actually were supposed to tell us, teach us a little bit, since we're here, about the wonderful Canadian town where you visited and what it's like to be a Jew in Canada. Well, <clears throat> this is this is sort of in the middle of Canada. I mean, this is not not in Vancouver, not in you know, not in Ontario. This this is uh, really out there. So this is a very small town called um, uh, where was I? Sask 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 Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and it's a town of about two hundred thousand people. It's actually the largest city in this province. Okay, um, which is why there's a city out there at all. Um, <clears throat> so the interesting things are... You said 200,000? Yeah, um, or 170,000. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, a, a significant number of people, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, not as big as Reno, but then not as small as Truckee, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a real town with a thriving economy, no unemployment whatsoever. Um, anybody who wants a job can have a job. Um, as is true, by the way, in a lot of cities in, in Canada. This thing that we, you know, this thing that we're struggling with in Reno of huge unemployment, you know, twelve percent unemployment, is very localized to us. Yeah. There's lots of places in the world where that's not a problem. So this happens to be one of those places. Um, so I just found it very interesting to go to a synagogue. Go to I went to a, the conservative synagogue in that town, um, which I think is um, Temple Agudas. Israel, I think is the name of it. And they didn't have a rabbi, but they had a Hazan, a very nice man. His name is Neil Schwartz, no relation. Um, <laughs> but he happens to be a famous guy because he has, uh, he has been studying and writing about um, Torah trope and methods of davening, of, of, of um, um, Musach, Mus Musach, uh, of, of Musach modes and how you how they're constructed and how they're designed and what they all mean, and uh, has put a lot of that knowledge into the program to fill a trainer, which you can buy for you know, for like, you know under a hundred dollars or something. A really wonderful program. But he taught me things about the program I didn't know about and things things about. Because you, you have trope trainer. I have trope yeah. trainer and I have fill a trainer. Uh -huh. And I didn't know lots of things about about them. He taught me lots of things. Awesome. So. Was, was, was there any synagogue in Allentown? No, no. So I went to Allentown, which is outside of Saskatoon. And in, in the town of Allen, spelled A-L-L-A-N, just like me, they have, they have this enormous uh, uh, factory where they make uh, some, something called potash. I don't even know what that is. But um, the raw materials come, come out. From a distance, you see a bunch of railroad cars you know, for miles. And they look like little toys compared to this factory. So the raw materials come in in huge quantities and go out in huge quantities. At this so now we know about Allentown too. Yeah. So how, how large was the shul that you went to? Uh, I think he said that there were 130 member families and or 100 and something member families, uh -huh. and there were not quite a million Friday nights and just barely a million Saturday morning. Okay. So. But pot is very important. We need to talk about Okay. I didn't because know. it's a basis for fertilizer. It's also a basis for explosives and used in gunfire. Well, thank you, Mike. And it's mm -hmm. made primarily from nitrates. Um, Thanks. I, I have to look it up, but I think it's, it's See, all this wonderful. All this wonderful, you're, 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 you're welcome wow. information. Wow. Okay, so we, we so, actually still have some time left. Let's um, pick up. It, it'd be great if we could finish at we, least we this track tape. There it would be. Um, no, that wasn't on my list. I thought I'd, oh, okay. I'd give you an extra copy, but uh, thank, okay, thank you. So this next piece has to do, uh, or has been used by some people to describe a student with a disability. And it's kind of a, a lovely sort of uh, method that the teacher uses to deal with this particular student. So, Diane? Rabbi Parita had a disciple to whom he repeated everything 400 times, and only then did the disciple absorb it. One day, Parita received a message that he was required for some mitzvah. He repeated the lesson to the disciple as usual 400 times, but the disciple did not absorb it. 
Marita said to him, what is the difference today? He replied, sir, the moment they said to you that there was a mitzvah to attend to, I lost my concentration because I kept thinking, now sir is getting up to go, now sir is getting up to go. Parita said to him, put your mind to it and I will teach you again. He repeated the lesson another 400 times. Okay, so can you imagine the patience that was required for this teacher? Now, usually the student is supposed to, first off, be the one repeating the lesson. Normally, in most of town, we learn that it's done 100 times. And the one who does 101 is completely over the top in terms of like really seriously learning. Now we have a rabbi who's doing it for his student, and he's doing it a second 400 times. Thus, Abbot Kohl said, um, let's see. A heavenly voice issued forth and addressed Parita. What would you prefer as a reward that 400 years should be added to your life or that you and your generation should attain the life of the world to come? He said that I and my generation should attain the life of the world to come. The Holy One, blessed be he, proclaimed, grant him both. Okay, so often there is that case when one is offered a reward, but the reward is for other people, often these agotic stories come and say, okay, so since you chose on behalf of the community instead of just something for yourself, then let's give a vote. So. The theme of squaring boundaries is resumed, plunging the student into one of the major issues of calendar calculation. The rabbis taught, when you square the town's boundaries, you square them according to the world squaring, north to the world's north and south to the world's south. The mnemonic for this is Aries to the north and Scorpio to the south. Rabbi Yossi says, if you don't know how to square according to the world squaring, you should square according to the sun's path. How do you do that? The side where the sun rises and sets on a long day is towards north. Where the sun rises and sets on the short day is towards the south. At the Nisan and Tishrei equinoxes, the sun rises directly east and sets directly west as it is written. It goes southward then round to the north, Ecclesiastes 1.6. It goes southward in the day and round to the north, toward night. Round and round goes the wind, Ecclesiastes 1.6. This refers to the eastern and western sectors. Sometimes it goes along them and sometimes around them. Rav Mershar Shah said these rules don't apply for it was taught. The sun never rose in the northeastern quarter and set in the northwest, nor did it rise in the southeastern quarter and set in the southwest. Shemuel said, the Nisan equinox falls precisely at one of the four quarters of the day. That is the beginning of the day, the beginning of the night, midday or midnight, the Tishrei equinox falls at one and a half or seven and a half hours, hours whether in the daytime or at night. From one tekufa to the next 91 days, seven and a half hours, no tekufa may drag more than half an hour from another. Shemuel also said, if the spring equinox coincides with Jupiter, trees will be shattered by storms. If the winter solstice coincides with Jupiter, plants will wither. That is, if the birth of the moon occurred at the hour of the moon or of Jupiter. Okay, so here's just a little thumbnail sketch on astrology that we see that often, you know, is a theme that's woven through Talmud in many different places, um, as well as even Maimonides will um, have some comment with regard to it. At the time, that was their, quote, science. You know, that, that is what they, they used. And, and it's almost like a farmer's almanac, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> and all that science, <laughs> that. All yeah. that science got lost some, sometime in the Dark Ages. And it was, you know, in some of the time of Galileo, um, he, you know, it, it wasn't known. It wasn't well known. It's not it was considered a heretic because it seemed something against, against, you know, their canonized Bible at the time. Right. How could things not revolve around the earth? Certainly they do, right? right? Yeah. So I don't understand that. So that, that all this was written, I mean, this was all in the Talmud, which, which I assume was like a well known book, even to. Uh, for us. For us. Yeah. And, you know, in, in the Dark Ages, then we dealt with situations where people had to leave, like in the 1400s, you know, get out of town quickly, yeah. kind of thing. So, and, and it wasn't just us. I mean, certainly there were Chinese astronomers, that sort of thing. Yeah, but the knowledge didn't spread as it was the world as fast as it spreads now. Right, it exactly. It was time to see, like, Agashi was deep in Spain. Okay. At the same time, uh, it was going into Spain, just across the board. And how dangerous it was to travel this route, which is it's very fast. Now I think it's 
COVID, uh, but they had so much, like the science already developed at that time in the States, but just didn't know that. Right. It's right. I mean, right. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, and then you look at the laws of hospitality mm -hmm. and how important that information was when people came. That was your, that was how you got news. Uh, right, so so um, just on a note, the January 28th, next Saturday night, we're going to be doing seat seat, 6.30 to 8 o'clock, and uh, probably next week we may start with forum, because it may take us a little while to get through those tractates. Um, and February 4th through 25th, we're dealing with texts from the Carmona Rebbe, who was, uh, I think, five or six generations from the Baal Shem Tov, very strongly relied on the Baal Shem Tov for his discussion from the book, You Are What You Hate. In Hebrew, it's actually called the Tig Yichud, so it's the path of unity. So that's uh, between that and also uh, the, the greater like, context or text is called the Tig Mitzvotecha, or the path of your commandments. And then we so, have to, to be Shabbat coming up, to be Shabbat, February 8th, 7th. 7th. February 7th, we're going to be doing a Seder. So, Shortly. Anyway, thank you.